series of Zoom lectures on uh, mechanical ventilation. And Dr. Chandana Karunaratna, he is a consultant anesthetist and he is a, a senior consultant anesthetist who is more interested and very much interested on this ventilator mechanics and ventilator working principles. And I should proudly say he is one of the pioneer to initiate the ventilator production in Sri Lanka, but unfortunately due to some some reason it's on hold now, I think. Uh, and he is... I think he, ha he has done a lot of uh, workshops in Sri Lanka for the postgraduate trainees for on mechanical ventilation and principles and all the minute details about mechanical ventilation. And he is one of the uh, most eligible persons to talk about mechanical ventilation in anesthetic practice in Sri Lanka. So uh, welcome, Chandana, and over to you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. I hope all of you can see my presentation. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so what um, today, what I'm going to do is actually touch upon uh, more practical aspects of um, ventilation. I mean, there is, you need to know the theory uh, because ventilation is a quite uh, tricky uh, practice. It's like, you know, um, uh, you, you have this is something you have to master uh, with your knowledge. With time, you will become an expert, but it's not going to be happening, you know, within a couple of weeks because there are so many things we have to learn. Um, so first of all, before I go into details of uh, my scenarios, this is actually scenario based. Uh, uh, try to touch upon uh, most important aspects of uh, ventilator issues, but b before that, uh, I thought of. Uh, explaining um, or try to make sure that you understand the how the ventilator works actually so compared to a patient who is not connected to a ventilator like a normal breathing person and somebody who is connected to the ventilator you must have realized like you know even if we have an n95 mask on our face after a few hours we find it uh, difficult to breathe kind of it's not very comfortable now imagine a patient who is connected to a ventilator? Like when um, I mean, with the N95 mask, we can actually uh, get whatever the flow requirement we want. Like when we want to breathe, take a deep breath, we can we have enough air in the environment, and we can breathe through the mask. It's not a big problem, but still we find it a little bit difficult because of some kind of resistance. Now in a ventilator, it's a completely uh, different situation because it's completely closed system. So um, now. How the a ventilator delivers a breath is actually so you can see in this diagram. So you, I have uh, shown the ventilator over here, and uh, you have an inspiratory valve and expiratory valve, uh, two valves which controls the flow of uh, gases. So ventilator can generate some flow, some pressure, but these valves will determine which direction the gases are flowing. Now, how a ventilator delivers a breath is actually first we close the expiratory valve and push some gas from this uh, inspiratory valve, open the inspiratory valve and send some gases. So the lung expands because of this uh, flow of gases. The expiratory valve is closed. So when the, so, so, so it actually generate some elastic recoil um, uh, potential in the lung. So when you open the expiratory valve, closing the inspiratory valve, the gases will flow through the expiratory valve into the atmosphere. So exhalation happens because of the patient's recoil forces of the lung. So you cannot control how fast uh, the lung is exhaling unless you can control the patient's lung, you know, compliance and resistance, something, you know, give him medication, something like that. Otherwise, it's a passive thing happening because of the energy stored during the inspiration. So exhalation is very, very important. So make sure that exhalation is complete all the time. Uh, when you um, do any changes to the respiratory rate, you have to make sure because exhalation time, you are not changing. You are only changing the inspiratory time when it comes to uh, ventilation. So all the technique you do to the inspiration, exhalation is a passive thing. You just open the valve and the patient exhales through the... So ventilation is actually management of inspiration and changing 
the 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 rates and every other, other parameters so it's very important to understand this is a completely closed system so we assume whatever the mode we are using the rates and the pressures and the flows everything um so we assume so these are the maybe the the beneficial uh, flows rate you know rates and everything for the patient but the patient does not understand what you are trying to do but he, patient has got his own requirement his own flow requirement his own um respiratory rate requirement so there is a big discrepancy if you do not understand the ventilation and the patient's pathological condition so whatever you try to do patient may not agree with it and the neural respiratory drive everything will clash with whatever you try to do so it's extremely important it's a very uncomfortable condition when the patient wants something else and you are providing something else and then the patient we call it patient fighting the ventilator it's not actually patient fighting we do not know how to tackle the ventilator to the patient's requirement so that is actually not the patient is fighting he fights because it's not what he requires what he ex expect from us expect from the ventilator that is why he is fighting so uh, it's extremely important without knowing how the patient is behaving uh, so you just try to apply whatever you think the patient needs then it's going to be a um, problem so if the patient's flow demands and timings are not met then you will have a unhappy struggling patient on the ventilator so all what you can do it if you don't know is to paralyze and sedate the patient but that's not the ideal thing to do so we'll try to uh, figure out certain using some scenarios uh, what are the common um problems the patient encounters on a, a ventilator how can we fix those issues now there are i mean i hope you know about the mandatory beds and the assisted beds we call it mechanical beds like the ventilator delivering beds and the spontaneous or supported beds we call it spontaneous beds so if you categorize these two like you know ventilator giving a breath and the patient taking a breath so so we look at like the patient the in the ventilator breath ventilator or clinician decide okay i want to give this patient 10 breaths a minute or 15 breaths per minute or 20 breaths per minute so the timing will be decided by the clinician so every maybe every 6 second every 4 second whatever the depending on the rate the mechanical breaths will be delivered spontaneous breaths on the other hand patient initiate so unless the ventilator knows when the whether whether the patient is breathing or not, then the patient ventilator cannot support. So it's it's important to uh, know when the patient is breathing. So some of the ventilators are very efficient in detecting patients' attempts. Some ventilators, depending on how you set the ventilator and the ventilator itself, may or may not know that the patient is breathing. So patient may have an issue of getting air because as I told you. The, unless the inspiratory valve opens, you can't get air. So it's very uncomfortable. It's like, you know, you have a face mask, which is like, you know, completely closes and opens time to time. Unless you, I mean, it, unless the valve opens, you get air, you can't breathe. You can try to, a patient will try to attempt to breathe, but still patient will not get air unless the ventilator opens the inspiratory valve and uh, gives some flow. So very uncomfortable unless you, uh, uh, set the ventilator proper. Now, inspiratory flow pattern, like a, if if the patient is paralyzed and ventilated, then the patient is not generating any flow. So, the ventilator can deliver whatever the flow we plan to give. So, it's probably the easiest way on the clinician side how to control the ventilation, but it's not the safest way or not the most comfortable way for the patient. Patient breath, it's unplanned. We don't, patient will take uh, respiratory rate of 14 for some time and maybe try to take 12 or 10 or it will change so it's a variable thing patient's pattern and depending on the patients whether the patient is getting acidosis then patient will try to breathe out faster things like that because inspiratory flow pattern peak flows and timings will change in a spontaneous breath mechanical breath we we set it for few hours maybe for a few days sometimes if you are not very careful and then from inspiration to exhalation, ventilator decides how to do that, but the patients, they have a different timing. And the duration of breath also, ventilator, we usually set, okay, inspirate time of one second, 1.5 second. We set the duration of the breath. 
But in the spontaneous breath, patient decides and the neural drive will decide how long am I going to breathe. So that, that is also a variable thing. And that, so these timings, so for example, um, um, if you take, say, say when volume control ventilator, breath will deliver a constant flow of ventilation. So this is actually flow. And this is the time. And then flow has got a direction. It's a vector variable. So, so this is the above the x-axis. This side is actually towards the patient. So this is inspiration. Ventilator delivers a breath by simply pushing a constant flow into the lung. And then exhalation is passive, as I told you. So always exponential decay. So it has got a di different direction. So this direction is away from the patient, exhalation. So anything above the, this line is inspiration. Anything below is exhalation. Now, if you look at this curve, so if the patient is paralyzed and ventilated, there's no problem. Patient is not asking for a flow. He cannot bleed, breathe because of paralysis. But if the patient starts breathing, now his breath will never be like a constant flow. So usually the patient has a peak flow and this kind of a flow pattern. So if the patient is on a volume control breath, now the patient starts breathing, now he finds it difficult to breathe because he is not getting this peak flow. He tries to breathe, but he's not getting that peak flow. Then keeping a patient in volume control breath and then trying to wean the patient. So during the mandatory with machine breath, patient finds it difficult to breathe. This is an obvious thing. So if the patient was on volume control, so it's if the patient struggles, then it's it's a better idea to change it over to pressure control mode where you only maintain the pressure and the patient can take whatever the flow you want. So likewise, uh, because we do not understand the timing and the flow pattern patient tries to take, our ventilation will be difficult. So knowing the theory is not adequate. You have to apply whatever the learned theory into the patient uh, ventilation then and there, and then see how the patient responds. Now, I'll take one scenario. These are all real-life cases I have experienced. This was an advice um, asked from me uh, about the patient management They're over the phone. So this was a patient with pneumonia and sepsis who was connected to ventilator and getting a 50% oxygen, SIMV, pressure, sub pressure control, pressure support mode, and pressure control of uh, 25 and a pressure support of 15, PEEP of 7, respiratory rate of 40. So this, most of the uh, places in the world and even in our country, so they try to keep the uh, IE ratio to 1 is to 2 because people believe we, we usually breathe at a rate of, I mean, ratio of 1 is to 2. So that is true. So if we take a normal breath, generally we breathe via our inspiration time to exhalation time is somewhere around one to two, the time ratio. But ventilator, it's an artificial thing. Say ventilator, for example, so we set an IE ratio of one is to two with a rate of 10. Say respiratory rate is 10. That means per cycle of breath, we have six seconds. So, so this two seconds and four seconds. That is how, so this is what the ventilator designs to do. So it tries to deliver a breath over two seconds, let's say 500 ml, and then it allows four seconds for the patient to exhale. But the actual patient's breath, so maybe inhalation, sorry, patient tries to take an inspiration like this and it finishes before two seconds is over. And then his exhalation is something like that. So he finishes before, I mean, it's okay to, wait for the next breath and sometimes this breath is too long for example this patient has finished the breath due over here but he has to wait until the ex this is where the expiratory valve opens so you can't exhale the way you want the expiratory valve has to open for the exhalation so this patient has to wait another maybe a few seconds until the valve opens, so half a second, or maybe one second, something like that, depending. So this, uh, so that if you try 
to make one is to two on a ventilator. So he actually the they have tried to actually calculate the exact one. I just tried to calculate. So when you try to rate of 14, 60 divided by 14, and then one is to two is one third of inspired time. So you get 1.422 to something like that. So they have exactly put the I ratio one is to two. Now we'll see. Um, so this is what the patient is not settled. So he struggles. He needs a lot of sedation. This was the uh, question they asked me. So what can we do uh, to sort out this issue? So do you think this inspired time is good or anybody has any any idea? You can just uh, so we try to be a more interactive session. So do you think uh, anybody has any comments about this uh, graph? So I'll try to explain about the graph. So first, that the uh, yellow one is the pressure time curve. So it shows the pressure rises, whatever the pressure control level. And then this is the inspiration. And this part is expiration. And the green one is the volume. So volume rises up and then like that. And then blue one is the flow. I told you it's a vector variable. Um, so top one is the inspiration. The bottom one is ex exhalation. Anybody has any idea about this? Anyone? OK, now, um, so you can see. So how do you know the inspiration expiration? So it, when you look at this kind of a complex waveform, it looks like, oh, this is so complicated. I will never be able to understand. But this is not that difficult if you have a systematic way of approaching. So what is a systematic way? So you have to figure out which one is inspiration. So it's not that difficult. Inspiration is anything above the baseline in the flow. That is the inspiration. So this part is the inspiration. So whatever corresponding stuff, so this part is inspiratory volume. This part is inspiratory pressure. That's how you get the inspiration. The rest is... So you can see the inspiration to exhalation. Although we set it 1 is to 2, now patient is time trying to breathe faster. But it doesn't mean ventilator will try to deliver 1.42, whatever the 1.42 inspirated time per breath, mandatory breath. So ventilator tries to deliver 1.42, but the patient, when you try to breathe, patient tries to breathe at a rate of 27. So patient can take breaths in between the SIMB breath uh, mode, but the inspiratory time we have fixed. So that's why I told you that ma machine breath or ventilator breath we set, the patient may or may not like. Now here the patient does not like to have a, because he tries to breathe faster, but the ventilator will have a fixed inspiratory time. Because you try to set the IE ratio, you fail to recognize the patient's breathing pattern. So this is one of the most common problem patients encounter during ventilation because the clinician thinks IE ratio has to be 1 is to 2. IE ratio 1 is to 2 if you only take so this part. So this is the inspiratory part and this is the exhalation part. That is 1 is to 2. But the artificial IA ratio we create in the ventilator is not necessary. I mean, it's actually obstructing the patient's breathing pattern. So what you should instead do is to figure out the patient's inspiratory time. So you, how do you know that one? You can actually, I mean, this is not very clear. So usually you look at the volume pattern. If, if it, so you just try to make sure you don't have any redundant space. Now, here it's not very clear. I'll show you in a different um, uh, video. Now, so what I try to do in this instance is actually, so once, once again, this is the same thing. Uh, so I try to do is um, to reduce the inspired time to 0.8. So when I do it 0.8, you can see his breathing is now much better. So he settled because his breathing pattern so point eight actually you can what you do is you you try to look at this inspiratory flow pattern i don't know whether you can see it so inspiratory flow pattern so this is the curve so you just you can reduce the ex, at redundant time you can you can reduce keep reducing until you see an inspiratory flow pattern like this which goes up and comes back to baseline not more than that so that is the patient's neural inspiratory time the patient tries to breathe tries to achieve a flow during that time. So 
is you can just do trial and error stuff or class reducing you should not have a so one other way of looking at is uh, looking at the volume curve so i'll show you in the volume curve here you can see volume rises up though this is your inspiratory volume so if you this axis if you look at the volume you can actually see what the inspiratory volume is. but the expiratory volume over here does not come back to baseline so that is one problem we had in this particular one actually this patient had a leak pro from the angle piece so when i said uh, there is a leak but the the other side it was actually senior registrar so i can't remember he or she said uh, there is no leak i said no i there is a leak you can actually say how much the patient is leaking by looking at the curve maybe some 400 ml here so but because you have a larger leak sometimes you don't hear it because you have a larger bigger um, defect the smaller defects can give you us you know some turbulence and sound sometimes the larger defects you may not hear it so the the angle piece was changed and the patient's breathing returned to normal and patient so you can see in the new uh, after settling where you can see nicely the inspiration the flow comes back to baseline and you don't have any redundant time and you there is no leak now the volume curve come back to baseline so inspiratory expiratory if there is a leak inspiration i mean the, the the volume curve has a defect it doesn't come back to baseline so you can see this curve this graph is what we usually request so this is this shows that patient is fairly comfortable coming not necessarily but is much more comfortable compared to the original problem patient had because of the inspiratory time we we said i ratio 1 is to 2 and this inspiratory time is not what the patient wants patient tries to breathe faster and you should provide a shorter inspiratory time depending on the patient's requirement it's initially difficult to guess but this is how so this is one of, one of the most common problem of uh, you know, patients fight, fighting the ventilator is setting the i ratio 1 is to 2 without without uh, you know assessing the patient's requirements it's not a bad thing to set to 1 is to 2 if the patient is happy with that you know for example a post operative um, patient we do it for some other less or lung disease but we ventilate for some other reason then it's okay to have a normal rate and normal ira one is two is perfectly fine but in a critically ill patient who tries to be faster and a dif different some kind of lung pathology then you should consider patient's breathing effort rather than trying to set a ira ratio so it's not a bad thing to set as i told you but it's always when you have a lung pathology when the patient tries to breathe in, uh, in a different rate then you try to match the patient's inspiratory effort rather than trying to set a uh, but in a paralyzed patient that's perfectly okay because patient is not generating any effort you are the one who is in control so you can set there's no problem in a paralyzed patient but i'm talking about spontaneous breathing patients okay i hope you understood that one anybody has any question about that one i can answer before i go to the next scenario uh, is there a way to identify there is a leak in the pressure curve so you have mentioned in the volume uh, yeah. volume curve yeah uh, so volume curve you are identifying with the highest highest one and the uh, yeah. plateau one and calculating how much it's leaking yeah so like so, in the pressure curve how it will be looking in the pressure curve it's difficult because pressure actually for example this is a pressure control ventilator so ventilator will try to maintain so if you say pressure control of 20 unless it is a big leak so it tries to maintain that pressure by increasing the flow so if you see so this actually you can see the pressure is 30 over here so if the i mean if you are very vigilant you might see the the patient's flow to maintain this pressure so i mean this pressure is 30 so if you look at sorry flow now this is actually flow of 80 the no so 78 something like that so if you need very high flows for example if this flow shows some 200 liters per minute very high flow rates to maintain okay. some, you know pressure of 20 or something that means there is a leak but it's not very um prominent it's difficult to identify i would usually say for a novice person that it's difficult unless you have a curve like this for example you lose the pressure because you you don't have a flat curve because the 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 flow is not sufficient to maintain that pressure so you will not have a flat pressure curve you will have you know something you are losing you can't maintain that pressure or you will have a 
quite a rounded kind of pressure uh, because you cannot generate that pressure with the increasing flow even because the ventilator fails to maintain that pressure because there is a big leak. Otherwise, pressure curve waveform, you, find, you can't, normal situation, you can't use pressure curve to detect the leak. But it's usually the volume curve we look at. Volume, uh, so because uh, in the inspiration, if it goes up to some certain level, it should come back to the baseline. If there is any any cutting like that, so that amount is the leak amount. So you can easily see if the ventilator has got a freeze function and you can you know use a cursor or something, you can exactly see how much. Or you can even look at the um, inspirator expert tidal volume in the numeric section of these ventilators, but sometimes they are not that uh, reliable. So you if you have you can if you see a volume curve cutting off, that is probably the best indicator for a leak. Uh, so I hope you understood the pressure curve. Usually you can't unless you have a very big leak, which is not showing a good uh, square pattern of pressure wave. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, in, in a volume control ventilation, also the same way we, are, we will. Yeah, volume that. control ventilation. So usually volume control. Now the so this is how the uh, flow happens in the volume control. Usually constant flow. The pressure usually rises like that, but if the pressure doesn't rise. You know, it's something like that. So then it could be the patient is generating more demand during that patient tries to breathe, or there is, you know, flow, you don't have enough flow because there is a leak. But these are kind of advanced stuff. Uh, so you can't simply say this is a leak. Maybe, so maybe the patient is trying to breathe, and then whatever the flow given by the ventilator is not adequate. So those things can happen. But I think it's too advanced for other people. So I would just stop here about the, the that one because otherwise uh, it will become more complicated for the average person i know you you will understand so maybe um, if you want more details i can de describe maybe after the uh, this thing otherwise uh, i'm going to confuse uh, the rest of the audience yeah, okay sure all right thank okay. you all right now so this is another scenario once again uh, this patient is also distressed on the ventilator um, this was actually one of my um, patients that was somebody else's this is one of my patients when i came to a new hospital so i saw um in the morning ward round and one of my mo asked that the patient is um, struggling shall i paralyze we tried to do everything but shall i paralyze because he's not tolerating he's fighting with the ventilator now once again if you look at the i ratio if you calculate so they have set it to one is to two now is it appropriate in this patient? Can you say, I mean, this inspiration? So when you look at it, as I told you, initially it will be quite, you know, intimidating to look at waveforms like this. So, but if you have a systematic way of approaching, you can figure out which part is inspiration, which part is exhalation. So anybody thinks this I range, I mean, inspiration time is adequate or short, too short or too long? Anybody? Anybody thinks this is too too short or too long? If you don't answer, I, I think you haven't understood anything. So I have to go back to the very basics. But if you answer, then I can get some idea whether you understood what I said. Okay, I'll just go back to the basic ones. So it's now look at the inspiration. So how do you select the inspiration? So I told you in the flow curve, anything above the baseline is inspiration. So this is where the inspiration starts in this particular, I mean, this breath. And then, so and though this is where the exhalation starts. So this part is the inspiration. So anything on the chart up to this point is inspiration. So what is happening? So you can see this part, patient is taking some air into the lung. At this point, inspiration is finished. I'm the patient's inspiration. But the ventilator inspiration runs for 1.55 seconds. So rest of the time, patient tries to breathe. But the expiratory valve is closed. Now we have set a pressure control of 22, which is something of Hamya But 
but the after that patient tries to breathe out but the valve is closed so he has to generate some pressure to open up the valve but still the valve is not open so this hump over here is patient tries to breathe out because the valve is closed so these are the kind of complex stuff but i'm just saying if you don't understand that part at least understand this inspiratory time is too low because you still, you figure out where the inspiration is and you get flow only this part so that that is the issue so once again setting ie ratio was the issue so how do you know that you can see that ph is the patient is slightly become acidotic and carbon dioxide 51 because the breathing is is difficult patient in patient struggles on the ventilator oxygenation may become even worse if you let this go on because it tries with them I and you get both alveolar damage and then ventilation become much more difficult and then the po2 and then you will get a ventilator induced lung injury and you will get ards in a few days time then you will manage ards which was not there initially but which started because of the ventilator patient interactions so this is how some of the ards happening in uh, most of the i mean lot of places because we fail to uh, prevent the ventilator induced lung injury so once you know this fact you can minimize a large proportion of the ventilator induced lung injury or some of the ARDS you find in your ICUs simply by setting the inspiratory time to the patient's requirement when the patient starts breathing. When the patient is paralyzed, you can just set I ratio 1 is 2, no problem. So once again, so once you set, now you can see the same patient, the same settings, uh, stuff, FIO2 same, P, everything is same. Okay, I ratio, only the inspirate time is different. Now look at the pattern of breathing. It's very, very regular. There is some problems which I don't want to discuss because it's too advanced, but still the pattern we have matched. There is some other problem um, which is a bit too advanced, but, but, but you can see by setting the inspirate time, you can settle some of these uh, problems and then you don't need so much sedation. You can minimize the sedation if you are perfect, you can actually ventilate patient without giving sedation, but I wouldn't recommend anybody doing that. I have done that in the past when I was always in the ICU uh, looking after patients. When I was young, I did that one because I, I could have, you know, now I don't want to, you know, be there and looking after patient all my whole day. But those days I was young, I, I could do that. So, um, so you can minimize most of the sedation. Sedation is needed because patient i mean for example patient coughs on the ventilator in something like that and you your settings will not allow the patient to you know open the valve and cough out or just uh, patient is not allowed to breathe out the way he wants then you need to set it because patient will struggle because he cannot breathe in and out now you understand with the mask we find it difficult to breathe n95 mask now with the closed system they are like you know suffering like in hell you know suffering because they are awake they are suffering. So that's why we need sedation. But once you understand how to set up the ventilator, then you can minimize sedation. You can make them comfortable. All right. Um, so we go to the next scenario. Um, this is about a 49-year-old female with a body weight of 80 uh, and history of hypertension. This one was a septic patient. He had pneumonia uh, coming from uh, community. In, in the emergency department, blood pressure is 70 by 40. Uh, sorry, which was in the ward patient, 70 by 40. Uh, saturation was 90% uh, with uh, 8 liter per minute oxygen through face mask, and patient was anuric. Um, so, because of uh, work of breathing and everything, patient is uh, getting deteriorated. There was a decision to intubate this patient uh, and probably send to the ICU. Anybody tell me um, any anything you're concerned when you try to when you ask to in, intubate this patient? Anybody has any some kind of comment just just to make it more interesting? Anyone worried about anything in this patient? Blood pressure. Blood pressure. Yeah, blood pressure is low. So could it be blood pressure low and patient is anuric? Uh, so it's 49 year female, previously others hypertension, but no other big problem. It's uh, controlled hypertension. Would you think it's 
just renal failure or just pre-renal hypovolemia maybe pre-renal maybe pre-renal so this because if a relatively young person before then is i think relatively young and then blood pressure is low aneuric patient maybe patient was hypovolemic volume depleted because of the sepsis maybe she has not been eating and drinking well so this kind of patient when you intubate there is a risk of so because you you stop you give positive pressure and you stop the venous return and the, the patient can have a detrimental outcome if you try to intubate now if you look at the blood gas you can see patient is severely acidotic carbon dioxide is low maybe she is trying to hyperventilate and correct the acidosis oxygen is low bicarb is also low and there is a aa gradient so carbon dioxide usually 35 to 45 but this is actually low value oxygen should be high usually above 6 you normal person closer to 100 in drone room yeah. bicarbonate is 22 to 26 but this is actually low that means that bicarbonate is the one which counteracts the acidos acidosis a, a gradient for those who do not know what a, a, a capital a means alveolar alveolar simple a means arteria so usually if you have certain, say, 100 of alveolar oxygen, the artery has basically same, almost same, maybe 99, 97, couple of millimeters, but otherwise, basically, there is no big gradient of alveolar to arterial, uh, big gradients, because the alveolar capillary membrane is normal. But if you have any, so there are four main causes of hypoxemia, but shunt and VQ mismatches. So there's different... Uh, lecture by all together but shunt and vq mismatches causing um, problems can have a big gradient because whatever the alveolar oxygen maybe alveolar oxygen is uh, 200 and so we say 300 but the arterial one is only 30 then you have a, this gradient for so arterial one is 60 here is 660 and this one is some 300 and in something uh, so you have a big gradient of a, a gradient so that that is that shows that there is some lung pathology if there is no a, a gradient that means lung is okay there's something else is happening with the patient uh, so once again patient is already hypotensive hypovolemic so there is a risk of car this is actually quite common especially uh, um, come, I mean consultants they know that when they sometimes ask for ICU bed, some people ask for ICU bed and we ask them to intubate the patient and send because the patient is unstable. So the moment they intubate, whole history is, we, we usually when they say, okay, patient is not on inotropes, patient is otherwise stable, but saturation is low, uh, becoming you know worse, we need to send the patient to the ICU so that we ask them to intubate and send. So after the, so when the patient arrives in the ICU, patient is on a lot of inotropes, had a cardiac arrest and research area, things like that, because if you do not look after the cardiovascular aspect. So one thing you can do is to, if you have time, you can give some fluid, but sometimes it's not always possible. Patient is desaturating or so whatever the thing, you can actually give some fluid or, or the other thing is you can protect the blood pressure by maybe starting some minotros or more, give some vasoconstrictors before you give the anesthetic medication. Most of the time, if this was in the past, uh, people did not know when we used thiopentone, the dose they, because the ward doctors are not anesthetists, anesthetists, they don't know, they just look at the dose, okay, thiopentone, five milligram per kilogram, so they give about 300 milligram of thiopentone, which is a very big dose. You don't even give that dose for a um, um, hypotensive patient. So that will straight away kill the patient sometimes because of hypotension, uh, happening uh, in worsening of, they go into cardiac arrest. Same thing can happen if you give a normal big dose of uh, propofol because they don't, they're not anesthetic. They just try to give the same kind of drugs at the, in the ward, which is a problematic case. So if you are asked to in, intubate one of these patients, make sure that you give at least, I mean, give a lower dose of in, uh, induction. Agent. Maybe you can use ketamine sucks if you want, or even a lower, smaller dose of midazolam sucks, something like that. And then add some, Vasoconstrictor, if you do not have 
uh, I need to drop or some kind of pump to give, do that. You can even give some bit, bit of ephedrine or something before you um, give the drugs and incubate these patients. And especially when you apply PEEP, make sure that you you look after the pressure because PEEP can, so don't try to give a very high PEEP initially. So you can increase the PEEP one, once you uh, correct the um, but that pressure and you can slowly, slowly increase the PEEP. There is no rush to give a very high PEEP just because saturation is low. You can give high oxygen initially and later on you can slowly increase the PEEP. So this is how you should save, but still it's tricky. These people are having very high um, sympathetic drive to maintain their blood pressure. The moment you give anesthetic medication, they can crash at risk. So best to at least taking 10, 15 minutes to resuscitate these patients, give some volume before you intubate. And it's quite, quite important reassess because things can change within 10, 15 minutes. So initial few hours, you have to quickly, very often, you have to uh, frequently reassess these patients. Um, okay. The other scenario, anybody has any question about the previous one? All right. Now, the next scenario. Um, so once again, I told you, I mean, this is actually not, I mean, don't, just knowing the ventilation is not enough to priorities to look at the patient, what is the patient requirement, and then adjust your whatever the parameters. Uh, so I didn't discuss about the ventilator settings uh, in for that particular patient because I properly, I mean, I wanted to focus on the, the dangers um, and then give you more, more insight about uh, the framework of how to assess, approach a patient. Now, this scenario is a 53-year-old female with a fairly, um, you know, thin uh, lady. The history of asthma. Now the patient is in status asthmaticus. Blood pressure is normal, slightly elevated, and she looks quite exhausted and diaphoretic. She has a saturation of 99, 92 with a uh, low amount of oxygen. Now, asthma. I hope you learned about asthma, but I'm just gonna uh, go through a little bit faster because I hope you learn about these things. So. Now, in this particular patient, the pH is 7.12, carbon dioxide is 63, PO2 57, and bicarbonate of 29. So out of these four parameters, which one is the most alarming parameter? Anyone? If you want to make a decision, which one is the most alarming parameter? CO2. CO2, okay. very good, excellent. Yeah, CO2, now here, the pH is acidosis, you can do certain stuff to correct the acidosis. Oxygen you can, but this CO2 shows that this patient is going into a exhaustion and respiratory arrest. Because in asthma patients, usually because their carbon dioxide either normal or slightly low, but their, their problem is actually airway, not the lung, uh, capillary membrane, so yeah, oxygenation is usually okay, uh, but the carbon dioxide also usually try to, they try to uh, wash out carbon dioxide, but the only problem is uh, when they they have a high work of breathing because of the airway resistance and like it's like you know running a marathon, but after certain distance you fail. You can't you can just breathe at a normal rate, but if you try to have a airway resistance, high airway resistance, when you try to breathe, you at a certain point you fail to breathe because of ex simply exhaustion. So this is the sign of exhaustion, having carbon dioxide, even CO2 of 40 in a severe asthma is a danger sign. CO2 should not be 40, it should be lower than 40. If it reaches 40, that means the patient is exhausted. You can actually look at the serial blood gases if you really want. If it is going up, that means the patient is worsening and going towards respiratory failure. Now, managing asthma patients, so Honestly speaking, if you get a healthy person having a status asthmaticus, if you went, they should not die from ventilation. But it's it's not uncommon. It's not impossible sometimes because the caregiver does not know how to tackle this problem. Some of these patients end up dying. I'll tell you how it happens. Uh, so when you have an asthma patient, always try to get some advice from a senior person who has some experience in managing uh, asthma patients, or at least make sure that you have enough knowledge 
I'll, I'll tell you the core principles of managing asthma. Uh, so this patient needs ventilation because of exhaustion, high carbon dioxide, as you correctly said. Now, I'll tell you in this particular instance, some baseline, I mean, ba basic uh, principles of managing or setting up the ventilator. Not all the parameters, but basically you can start with the high oxygen because oxygen, the patient is having a low oxygen and it's no harm uh, starting with the high oxygen. We can always reduce oxygen once the patient improves. Now I told you uh, their problem is actually AV resistance. So you need to make sure that patient, when the patient inhales, whatever the volume should come out because I told you ex exhalation, you cannot control. Exhalation patient is elastic recoil from the patient. So ventilator should allow sufficient time for the exhalation. This is the key principle in managing asthma patients. Sometimes it's difficult, but still you must always try to allow at least you know, enough time for the exhalation. So how do you see, you, know, so you can look at the flow time curve. So I told you, Flow has got a vector variable. This is above the baseline is inspiration. Below the baseline is expiration. So expiration, this is high peak expiratory flow rate and it has a negative exponential and it comes and it should touch the baseline over here. So if it touches baseline, that means the exhalation is complete. Whatever the time you took, I mean the volume you took, took into the lung comes out. So you can see it by having a um, complete exhalation, you know, the flow touching the baseline, that means the exhalation is complete. So that is important um, in asthma or any patient, it's, it's important, but it's particularly important in asthma patients. So respiratory rate, so this is one of the problem people face, they, they think because the, um, um, patient is say hypoxic or carbon dioxide is 50 or something like that. Then they try to increase the respiratory rate to get a normal, never ever try to get a complete normal blood gas in a severe asthma patient. Because if you, um, unless it is happening automatically with the lower settings, but if you should, you should not increase the respiratory rate um, just to correct uh, pH or carbon dioxide if you cannot maintain a complete exhalation. So whatever the Respiratory rate, you can increase as long as the exhalation is complete. So it comes to baseline, then you can increase. But if, if it is cutting off like that, so you start the next breath over here. So this part of the breathing, this part of the exhalation was not complete. So that is actually trapped inside the patient's lung. So sometimes asthma patients, if they develop, say sometimes asthma patients, are, I have seen uh, in the ward situation, in a portable ventilator, nobody knows what is happening sometimes you don't have the flow pattern so it's a difficult one but one nowadays most of the portable ones they have the flow pattern the flow um, uh, curves but if you get air trapping sometimes they get pneumothorax and they put an IC tube but they still fail to identify this is actually due to the air trapping they think okay asthma patients it's possible to get this is how they get because they have sometimes they have bully but most of the time it's because of the air trapping that's how they get Pneumothorax. So if somebody gets pneumothorax, you must make sure that they are not having air traffic. And sometimes, so they get pneumothorax, they don't even detect that one, and they, the blood pressure drops, and then you start inotropes. But asthma patients, healthy ones, should not receive inotropes. If you if you need inotropes, make sure that the patient is not having a pneumothorax or some kind of big problem. So, so they sometimes die of these complications because people fail to identify this problem. You know, you must make sure that the, whatever the tidal volume should be exhaled. So it's difficult initially. So it may be a good idea to paralyze and these patients and use a lower tidal volume. Forget about the carbon dioxide. Uh, you know, having 50 or 55, it's not a very bad thing, even 60. So you prioritize uh, the complete exhalation over the control of carbon dioxide. If you try to control carbon dioxide, you might even kill the patient because carbon, carbon dioxide can be high, maybe 60 or 70 of carbon dioxide, but the patient is, you can't uh, increase the respiratory rate, but leave it there. It's okay. You They won't die. You can even, if you are worried about pH, you can give a bicarbonate, a little bit of bicarbonate, but you know, most of the time pH is 7.2, even 7.18, something like that. Still not too bad if the 
asthma is severe so the you you focus on treating asthma not the you know ventilation just this is what we can do maximally then you try to give bronchodilators and improve the patient's lung then the exhalation will complete much sooner then you can increase the rate and pick. so it's it has to happen after you improve the patient it should not be the priority. Priority is actually control of asthma, giving the medication, you know, maximizing the bronchodilators, things like that. Asthma is a reversible thing. Once you reverse the problem, or you give some, you know, steroid, whatever, you can just treat the asthma. Ventilator, you try to save the patient by giving the minimum, avoiding air trapping. That's some key thing in managing asthma. That's why. Right. Uh, so, ideally speaking, if you know these things, none of your patients with asthma should die if they are not complicated with some other cardiovascular, some other problem. So asthma itself should not kill with the ventilator, but it's not impossible. Sometimes these things happen. So always try to get some advice if you don't know what you are doing. Don't try to correct the pH by increasing the rate unless the exhalation is complete during your each and every breath. So generally volume, so I prefer volume mode. You can use other modes also, you can use other complicated modes, but usually volume control will give, we can give a certain volume other than, you know, if you give pressure control, once the patient improves, they will have a, usually you need high pressures. These pressures are actually not in the alveoli because of the airway resistance. The patient, the, the ventilator pressure will be high, peak pressure will be high, but the alveolar pressure is not high because you have uniform um, airway, con, um, you know, resistant you know high constricted airways so the pressure is actually generated towards the ventilator not inside the patient's lung so the pressure sensor is not located inside the patient's lung it's located in the ventilator so ventilator will detect high peak pressure but the alveolar pressure is not high but if you you initially you need higher pressures once the patient improves these higher pressures will cause volume trauma in the patient's lung so it's best to use volume control especially in the initial stages so that even if the patient improves, you are not getting a larger tidal volume and you can control the volume so that you can exhale that volume. If you give very large tidal volume, then you may need lo long exhalation time. So you can control the tidal volume. So it's best to treat, uh, treat this patient with volume modes initially, controlling the inspired volume so that the patient can exhale and treating the asthma, not trying to do magic stuff from the ventilator. So, and the PEEP, uh, here in asthma, you compare to the COPD, asthma, you try to use lower PEEP because, as I told you, the exhalation happens passively and they have a airway resistance also. In the meantime, you have high PEEP because somebody says uh, intrinsic PEEP, if you have trap air, you have, have external PEEP. No, here, this is different. You should not apply high PEEP because the, the, the exhalation happens passively. In a COP, it's a different story. They have a collapsible airway. They have what we call dynamic airway compression, some complex stuff. But these people have um, constricted airways. So they, you need to open up those airways. And you should not apply high peep. You should have a lower peep so that the patient can, you allow, make it easy for you to exhale. And this is actually an airway issue, not a compliance or lung issue. So you should not have a high peep in asthma patients. So as I tell you all the time, in most into the reassessment, whatever the attempt, whatever the changes you do on the ventilator, you have to have frequent assessment. This is the key thing. Otherwise, uh, you might think whatever you did was correct for the patient, but assessment is needed. We can always, even I, when I try to do certain in interventions, and I realized after 15 minutes, so that was my, you know, the workup, but patient did not. Uh, tolerate that kind of thing. So it's always important to reassess as often as necessary. Okay, now uh, COPD is a slightly different. It's basically the same, but slightly different because I mean, the similarity is once again, it's a problem with the airway. It's not, we have lungs are normal, they have high resistance and they can have air trapping. But here, air, air trapping is very difficult to control because they have damaged their lungs, not like in asthma patients, they have high airway resistance, which can be improved with bronchodilators and various other treatment, but these people have, you know, sometimes permanently damaged and there's nothing you can do to uh, completely recover the airway resistance. They always, they live with high airway resistance, they breathe like that. So it's quite important to know about the pre-illness or how they behave at home. It's extremely, extremely important. Otherwise, if the patient is saturating 90 at home, 
you know, usually that's a normal PO2 is something like a carbon dioxide is normally hanging around 55, something like that. So you cannot improve it to a carbon dioxide to 30 or something. You should not try to do that because you will keep the patient forever in the ICU because the saturation will always drop to 90 and then you will try to give more oxygen. You can't send the patient. So it's important, the pre-illness condition, knowing pre-illness condition and try to achieve closer to that target when you try to wean these patients. Now, once again, um, so, so how does, so this is actually, I'm um, just showing uh, sub, when the patient starts breathing uh, spontaneously, that is where the problem is. When you try to wean this patient, sometimes it's easy to control when you uh, say volume control, some kind of, you know, uh, breathing, SIMB stuff. You can initially manage the patient. Once you start weaning the patient, then people say it's almost impossible to wean these COPD patients. It's always a challenge. Even for me, it's a challenge. Um, so, so what some other, these are some other um, things you can do. So when they start spontaneous breathing, so how does the ventilator know to uh, time the inspiration time? So this is how ventilator does. So for example, if this is actually normal patient's uh, inspiration, when the patient tries to breathe, there is a peak flow. The ventilator knows peak flow because it has got flow sensors. We'll say the peak flow is 40 liters per minute. It is liters per minute. And then, so peak flow reduces and it, it reduces down to zero during inspiration when the lung fills. So ventilator decides, okay, I'm just going to look at 50% of 40 is 20 or 25% of 40 is 10. So 25%, when the flow reaches 25%, so it is going to open the exhalation well so that patient can exhale. So you lose a little bit of tidal volume, but it's not that significant. So the ventilator spontaneous breath is designed because ventilator does not know how the patient, you know, how long patient tries to take a breath. Now, we set in pressure control, volume control, we can set the inspired time, 1.5, 1.2, whatever the inspired time. But the spontaneous breath, patient takes and ventilator has got no idea how long it takes. This is how it guesses. So it checks the peak flow and remembers that one during that breath and wait until it drops to 25%. But if you wait until zero, then when you do the, all the, you know, opening up well, the patient will try to exhale and it will have a problem initial fraction of a second because the valve is still closed. So ventilator tries to open the valve. So when it reaches 25%, it opens the valve so that patient can exhale. That's how, but in a COPD patient, because they are in spirit, they have a, they have a airway resistant problem. So when you apply certain pressure, it takes longer you can say so usually they take longer say they have a lower flow but they take longer to reach so this flow is i'll just try to uh, erase these values um, okay sorry how do you erase Now, this flow will say 10 or something. So 10 to become 2.5, it takes long. Now, ventilator will not open the valve. Patient does not want to have a longer inspiration. He just try to breathe faster because he find it difficult to breathe. They have a problem of breathing. They are having a barrel kind of chest. They are trying to breathe with a larger chest. And they try to take some kind of effort to take a breath. But this peak flow... They don't want a large breath, but the ventilator does not know that one. Ventilator is designed, so it checks the peak flow and it waits until it drops to 2.5, 25%, which is a very long duration. But the patient doesn't want to have a long duration. Just try to, this ventilator does not understand what the, so that is why. So if, when the patient tries to breathe in a COPD patient, when they try to breathe spontaneous breaths on the ventilator, they find it difficult to breathe because they want to exhale somewhere over here. But they come because the ventilator does not open the valve. So what you can do is, is actually, um, I'll show you. Um, so you can actually switch off the breath. 
So exhalation threshold, I told you, exhalation threshold is usually 25%. So some of the ventilators, you can change this one. So if you make it 50%, so when it reaches, say, 40 liters, when it reaches 20, so it cuts off the inspiration over here. So that you have enough time for exhalation and you can control this. this. Without controlling inspiration in a COP, the spontaneous breath, you find it difficult to manage these patients because you don't have enough time for exhalation because the ventilator will not open the valve. It will keep on waiting for the flow to drop to 25%. So this is one of the commonest things in a COPD patient uh, trying to be in order to wean the patient and they struggle because they cannot have sufficient time for exhalation because the inspiration is too long. Ventilator is not opening the valve and they are struggling. They can't exhale. So that's a big problem. Uh, that's one way of controlling the inspiratory volume is to increase the exhalation threshold from 25 to higher value. The other thing is, so uh, you know that uh, they can have trapped air inside. When the air is trapped because the pressure sensor is located inside the ventilator, not inside the patient, so the ventilator does not know that there is trapped gas inside the patient's lung. Because it's trapped inside the lung. How does the ventilator know? Ventilator knows if the air comes out, it can know, but otherwise it does not know. So now, now imagine the COPD patient with a PEEP of five and a trigger set to two. What does trigger two means? Say if your PEEP is five, anything below two, two below the PEEP value is the trigger. So patient has the ventilator will trigger a breath if the pressure is dropped from baseline two centimeter volt. So if the pressure becomes three, then the ventilator knows, okay, this patient is breathing and it will trigger a breath. Now, imagine a patient who is having an intrinsic peep of 10. So you have up five and 10, another 10 on top of, so there is another additional 10 inside the patient's lung due to air trapping. Now he tries to breathe now, how does it trigger? So it, if he tries to breathe from 15 to down, it will not trigger because the ventilator does not know what is happening inside the patient's lung. It only knows how you know, so it's, it's waiting for three. That is how it triggers. So if the patient tries to breathe, now this patient has to generate a very large inspiratory effort just to get a breath. Now, this is the other reason. So they, they, they the ventilator is capable of delivering the breath, but it's not capable of sensing the patient's breath because patient does not have enough power to generate 10 plus 2, like 12 centimeter or so it's to breathe, patient has to generate a negative 12 to, just to trigger the ventilator. So this is another problem. So instead what you can do is you can actually raise your P to a value maybe we'll say 9 or something so that so he generates from 15 to 9 maybe it's six and another two eight so so rather than 12 you or if you make it 30 then you need only a small amount of pressure in addition to trigger the ventilator so ventilator uh peep if you increase so it just ventilator will check from the peep two centimeter water so if the peep is 12 if then the when the patient gets the pressure from 15 to 10 then he can get a breath. So that is one way, but this is not the primary thing. This is, don't do it as the first in, uh, intervention because this is the last thing you can do. If the you, if, when you have, I mean, don't do it when each and every patient because higher PEEP can damage because they have a quite compliant lung. You can even get a pneumothorax if you do it with a high pressures. So this is not the first thing. You try to manage the patient, you know, bronchodilator sometimes may or may not work. All other man maneuvers you know, allowing enough exhalation time, preventing auto -peep. Those are the primary thing, but if everything fails, I, I do it very rarely on these patients. I have done it in the past. As there were certain patients who were really benefiting from this maneuver uh, because there is no other way they can trigger the ventilator because they are very advanced COPD. But normal COPD, don't try to do this one because the higher PEEP, you know, uh, can have other problems also. So this is not the first thing, first intervention in a COPD patient, but it's a possible thing, it's a known thing, but don't try to do it on a 
asthma patient they don't have this dynamic airway occlusion they have constant airway occlusion because of the uh, bronchospasms you need bronchodilators for asthma you can use external peep to counteract uh, intensity peep in copd patients in selected advanced patient where the other all other pressures are failing and then the other important thing is to make sure that you have um, uh, maintain a hypoxic drive because they don't usually respond to um, carbon dioxide. These pe uh, people, they want some kind of hypoxic because they are carbon dioxide high all the time. And then because of the high carbon, di carbon dioxide, the respiratory acidosis usually gets corrected by increasing bicarbonate. And then the brain is not that sensitive to uh, carbon dioxide anymore. So they reduce their breathing and then when they, they need some kind of hypoxic drive to breathe. So unless you have PO2, so if you look at the Guinan physiology book, you will see the respiration will not increase until the PO2 comes down to 60 or less. So this is the PO2, this is the respiratory you know, breathing response. So if your PO2 is usually 100, so it comes down Unless it comes down to, I mean, 60 to 100, it does not have any increased respiratory drive. Then it drops to 60 or less, you know, 59, 58. That is how you get some kind of respiratory drive. So the patient should not have saturation of above 90 for these advanced COPD patients. COPD, not all patients are alike. Some people are just, they are not CO2 retainers. They have a normal oxygen saturation. They are okay. But these advanced COPD patients, if they are CO2 retainers, if their saturation is usually, you know, 88, 90, some, uh, 90, something like the range. So you should get their saturation down to that level for them to breathe. Like, you know, PO2 less than 60, usually 55, 60, something like that. Uh, so that's how they start breathing. Then you can give a small amount of oxygen, it's maybe in a couple of, just to maintain like around 88, 90, something like that. So they still have. But if you give a large amount of oxygen, this is what happens when COPD patients comes to the ward. Initially, you can give, say, somebody comes with high respiratory drive, saturation low, because they have a drive, you can give oxygen. But if they slow down and you have to reduce the oxygen, make sure that otherwise, if you have to ha have an idea whether it is, you can do blood gases to figure out if the CO2 is going up and the respiratory is coming down, that means they are going into apnea. And it's not very uncommon. You see, most of the time in words, when you give oxygen, initially they are okay, but after some time, uh, there's a reason for that one, but after some time, you don't have enough time to explain. But when you give high amount of oxygen, the when they are breathing very rapidly, they don't they are not getting enough oxygen to the lung. But when they slow down, their FIO2 increases. That is how actually it happens. Um, and then you have to be careful about their breathing rate. When they calm down, make sure that your carbon dioxide, we check your carbon dioxide level if you are in the ICU or some situation, because they may be going into apnea because of, uh, you know, uh, loss of hypoxic drive. Okay. So so I told you about this one, the exhalation threshold. Uh, actually, it's actually explained much clearer. So this is your exhalation threshold, 25%. But if you increase it to maybe some other values, you can actually get a lower tidal volume. The exhalation can start from here. You have enough time for the exhalation. If you do that, exhalation threshold, it's a maybe an advanced parameter. If you don't understand, just forget about it. You can ask somebody experience about that when you find that. Okay, um, I'll have a couple more scenarios. I'll see. So this is... Um, one important thing, not in other countries, but in our country, because we see a lot of uh, poisoning patients. And uh, this was a patient, not because of actually OP poisoning, there's some other problem. And this problem is not usually described in any of the books, so pay attention, and it's happening even in you know, almost all the ICUs, but it could, because it's not described anywhere else. Uh, people don't realize this is actually happening. Once you know from today onward, when you are working in the ICU, you will see these things and you will realize, and this has been happening in the past, but you never notice it um, because it's not in the book. Okay. So this was a patient uh, in my ICU um, in Tangol. Um, uh, so we he was okay. So he had an OP poisoning 
and we uh, went late. I did actually very minimal sedation. He was perfectly all right, lungs clear, everything is fine. So we were um, planning to extubate the next day morning. But in the morning when I came for the round, I saw that the patient is fighting the ventilator, like, you know, struggling on the ventilator. And then the nurse said, uh, uh, the MO said to sedate the patient. So just be before attempting to sedate, I saw the patient and I'll show you exactly what I, um, so this is, um, I don't know whether you can hear my audio. So um, I'll just show you once again, uh, pause it. So you, you can see, so I told you the, the first thing you have to do to check the inspiration expiration. So this is the inspiration. Anything above the baseline is inspiration, below the baseline is exhalation. So this is the inspiration. So you can see the volume, you get the inspiratory volume, this expiratory volume. But here you can't see any significant difference. So it doesn't look like, a, like usually you should see something like, you know, this, something like that during the, in, sorry, not here, near here. You should see something like that during the inspiration, but here you can't see anything like that. It's like some mountains, you can't differentiate the inspiration, expiration, um, pressure fluctuation in the pressure waveform. Um, so this is actually not described in the books, but this is happening very, very frequently because of some problem um, in our humidifiers in our country. I don't have time to go through the actual real pro problem. It's a very well-known thing. It's happening almost all the ICUs, but most people are not aware of it. This is actually um, the expiratory. You you generally you have a, um, some people put HMEs to the expiratory port, but it's not HME. You should not put HMEs in the expiratory port. There is a thing called a ventilator filter. They look like the same. Um, so here, of course, I'll show you in my video. We have a ventilatory filter. I'll try to. Yeah, sorry. I'll go back once again. I'll try to delete all this. Uh, uh, and then I'll try to show you. So you can see this is actually a ventilator filter, not an HME. But when I remove that one, you can see. You can see clearly. Now you see the pressure waveform. Now the reason why you had pro that problem is the exhalation was not possible. Patient was really struggling to breathe out because they, that filter is blocked by the water vapor. It's, it's a problem of the humidifier generating more water vapor, high temperature, more weight water vapor condensing on the tubing and blocking the expiratory valve. I don't want to uh, explain it in detail, but I want you to know that these things are possible. If you can't see, if the patient is struggling, and if you can't see this waveform, and it's all like, a, you know, uh, uh, or even if you see so this waveform, if it becomes something like that, say, something like that, that means the, the, the pressure should come back to peak value quickly because you open the valve to the atmosphere. In the exhalation valve, but even if it is open because of the resistance of the uh, HME or if you have put or the ventilator filter because it is blocked by the water vapor, then the, the pressure does not come back to baseline easily and it takes longer. The flow is actually very low because it, it, it is difficult for the patient to exhale through the blocked valve. So it's a very important thing to uh, because it's, it's very um, common, I have seen. Uh, in our country um, to have this problem. I have settled a lot of patients like this uh, in my uh, practice. So it should usually come back to like that. So I actually had a, a video of the patient explaining how he felt, but I can't show it because he's a public one. I can't show his face. Didn't have enough time to you know edit that video so that his face is hidden. So he actually explains that it's, it's difficult when you had the, so you have to change that one. To a, or because this particular uh, humidifier is faulty all over the country uh, because of some, some problem with the uh, temperature sensor. So this thing, is keep, this thing keeps happening very frequently. So if you are careful, you may pick up these problems and you will see at least one or two patients um, 
you know, every, every few months having this issue. Uh, and you can settle those patients. Some some of them actually, I had a couple of patients uh, died uh, with some other problems. So then only I investigated this one. Then I realized I couldn't get the information from anybody because nobody knew about this condition. I couldn't read it on any books or anything. So I realized this is the problem. Um, and then we settled. Now you know how to settle that problem. It's very important. It's practical. It may not be important for your exams because nobody knows it about that one, but it's important in your day-to-day -day practice. That's why I included that one in the presentation. Now, one big common problem, very common. I think everybody has experienced this one. So you have a patient with OP poisoning and they improve. The lungs become clear. They have good muscle power. You extubate. You send the patient to the ward and the patient looks better, lungs clear. And they stop the atropine and everything, off monitoring and put the patient in some other corner. And then they come back with a Another, we call it, uh, what is this, um, intermediate syndrome. Some people, sorry, call it, but I don't think it's intermediate. I think it is, it's because um, we stopped the atropine and we were too quick in sending this patient to the ward. So I try to extubate most patients as quickly as possible, but except COPD, uh, sorry, OP poisoning patients, uh, for some reason, I'll tell you why. Now, now, for example, imagine, uh, sorry. Um, so I'm just going to com compare the ventilated ICU patient and the spontaneous breathing patient in the ward. Now, usually we keep the atropine infusion to keep the, now these people, they die of pulmonary edema from their own secretion. In other words, they drown in their own secretions. So this, um, OP poisoning is about, you know, secretions, tears, uh, you know, salivation, cell excessive, you know, lacrimation, diarrhea, pulmonary fluids. So basically they die of, they are drowning of their own secretions. So that's why we start atropine infusion. Atropine infusion is not to correct heart rate is also low, but that's not the primary thing. In the world, we look at the heart rate because there are no other monitors. I mean, you can't, uh, you know, check the pulmonary secretion all the time. We can't be checking the lungs every... So you try to have a certain heart rate and then adjust the atropine according to that one because it's not in the ICU. But in the ICU, heart rate is not the target. Target is the lung sounds. You know, if the when the lung becomes clear, that's the... You know, at that point, you should start giving more and more atropine. So when the... So usually we keep the atropine infusion to keep the lung clear. In the ward, because the patient comes from the ICU, they think patient is okay, better, improved, so we don't need that infusion. They stop the atrophy because the lungs are clear, they stop the infusion. That's not too bad, but secretion clearance in the ICU, it's very easy. You have suction tubes, patient is intubated, and we do it regularly. But if the patient needs regular suctioning, frequent suctioning, that should not be the patient you know, to extubate and send the patient to But the, the problem is pulmonary secretion. So do not extubate until the pulmonary secretions are minimal. That's the idea. Just because patient has muscle power and conscious doesn't mean patient will be all right once they extubate. Because the problem is OP poisoning. Problem is secretions in the lung. So if you want to figure out the indication of, I know indication is no longer, but the indication is still there. You still have a lot of secretion. So that is the one you have to ask whether the patient is having a lot of secretions. They are having a lot of secretions. Don't extubate even if they have enough muscle power. Muscle power was not the primary reason we intubated the patient. It was the pulmonary, secret, pulmonary edema from the secretion. And then in the, once you extubate, the patient has to clear cough and your expectorate. So it's going to be a difficult I mean, they're going to have another pulmonary edema and have a, another coming back into the ICU. So usually in the ICU, they have a low secretion because we are, they are on atropine and they increase secretion when they go to the ward. And we monitor, we don't have monitoring in the ward and worker breathing low. And this is one area we think, okay, worker breathing less and patient is okay. But if the patient needs more frequent uh, suctioning to clear the secretions, don't extubate. Wait until the patient lungs are clear and you don't need frequent suctioning to clear the lungs, then that is the time you, know, you can think of weaning and extubating. Um, have um, another five minutes. I'll just try to, this is an easy one. Uh, so I'll just try to um, 
touch upon one at least one NIV case. So this is a patient um, uh, in I think Balapitiya Hospital. Um, so this patient, you can see this video and tell me. You look at the waveforms on the monitor. So this is a um, peep of seven and pressure support of five. So there is very little pressure fluctuation. That's normal. This is not, you know, blocked uh, uh, expiratory valve. This is not like because this is very little uh, pressure fluctuation. Okay. Any any anybody sees any abnormality? So you can see the minute ventilation is four liters per minute. Tidal volume is somewhere around two hundred eighty. Rate is 14. This is in spontaneous mode. Patient, these all breaths are patient's breaths. Patient is basically having a small, by little slight BiPAP, basically stable patient with a FIO2.4. I needing, I can't remember the exact reason uh, why the patient was on a BiPAP. But anybody having any suggestions or any comments about the patients? Uh, especially, I'm talking about the flow. Uh, just to make it easier. Any comments? Okay, so now you can see. Hi. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Time is expiration. Expiration time is too long. So this yeah. is actually, yeah, this yeah. is actually patient's breathing. So this is patient's pattern. So there is no fighting. Patient is breathing in and exhaling. So the IE ratio we, is not material. The patient is taking the breath. So this is the inspiration. This is the uh, inspiration. This is expiration. So patient is maintaining somewhat one is two. We don't know. But I'm talking about the the uh, some other abnormality in the um, this thing. So any lower tidal volume due to lower peak pressures. Yeah. So lower tidal volume, lower Lower peak pressures, yeah, yeah, that could be possible. So, you know, yeah, yeah. So, because tidal volume is too weighty, because we are giving lower support, that is one thing. But when you look at the sizes of the waveforms, the inspiratory and the expiratory flow waveforms, I just uh, erase the rest. Uh, yeah, there's a leak in the mask. Yeah, that's the thing. So there is a big leak in the mask. So it's important to identify. I mean, this patient, this was not a big issue because he is needing only a small amount of oxygen. Now, if you look at the, uh, say, sorry, uh, once again. If you look at the sizes, the inspiratory one is much larger, expiratory one is much smaller. So this means so that the inspiratory flow sensor is inside the ventilator. Ventilator knows how much gas is being given to the patient in the sense uh, given towards the patient, but what comes out from the patient is this much. That means most of the inspiration is leaked through the mask. So this is the thing. So when you work in the ICU or any place where you use NIV, train the nurses to look at this exhalation waveform. Make sure that you have a sufficient exhalation waveform. Not, I mean, it's difficult to have the same kind of area, but at least try to achieve a good exhalation waveform that is the way you should know the patient is i mean leaking the best best kind of easy best way of man managing the mask is looking at this waveform if you have a very tiny waveform that means we are leaking gases so this patient if he was okay because he does not need a lot of oxygen he's not very bad so it was okay but in a critical ill patient this could be maybe the wind so uh, this is how uh, after when we correct that one, so you can see now very good. Uh, you have a fairly good uh, exhalation one, but same settings. Now you can see the tidal volume has increased. Minute ventilation has risen from four to ten. Now this is where you get the FIO to four. Now, otherwise, you are just you know leaking everything. You are not getting enough tidal volume. You are not giving the therapy. I didn't change the support. Didn't change the CPAP. Anything. Everything else is same, but only the mask fit. And you can see a better waveform in the pressure also. So, so having the theory of NIV is not enough. 
if your mask is not fitted properly to the patient's face. But how do you know it? If you listen for the leak, you may not get it. I mean, big leaks, you may not hear any leak. So uh, it's important to make sure that uh, you look at the exhalation and train the nurses too. I mean, it's not a difficult thing. You might think, oh, yeah, how do we know? I mean, we haven't even heard of these things. But these are practical aspects of managing patients. If you don't have a proper mask seal, this is one of the most common. Even, even in here, I have seen the mask fit. Uh, I have seen some patients even in developed countries, the same thing happens. If the mask is not fit into the patient, then we try to do so various other management without, you know, actually what we needed was proper mask fit. Dr. Arivalagi, please off mute yourself, please. Dr. Arivalagi. Uh, yeah, uh, so that is one. Um, and then uh, I have, I don't know, I have one, I have a couple of minutes. I'll just try to so improve in the mask fit. Uh, now, people think tighter straps. Tighter strap doesn't always ensure better fit. So if you, for example, if you tighten over here, and then this thing will go that way and start leaking. If you tighten over here, and this will start leaking from these areas and start leaking. So it's not the tightest that people keep on tightening them and sometimes they get ulcers in the nose. It's going to be a very, it is always, I mean, very common that people over tighten and patients are, they cannot, I mean, it's very uncomfortable. Try on yourself. I have tried mask on my mask uh, from face. So if you tighten it's too much, it is difficult for people to, you know, tolerate that one. So they will not tolerate the uh, NIV because it's too tight. I mean, how can, it's very uncomfortable. It's kind of patients suffer a lot. So you should not tighten it. What you need is a better seal, not too tight one. So more uniform pressure around the mask is the more most important. It's not I mean, very light, but you have to have some kind of pressure, but it should not be too tight so that patient cannot tolerate it. They will try to you know, take it out. These are the kind of reasons how NIV fails, not because, I mean, otherwise it's the same kind of pressure. I mean, ventilator, same ventilator, same tubing. Everything else is same. The only the mask is different. Different. So if you, if you, if the mask is not fitted properly, you don't get that pressure and you don't get the proper therapy. So correct size of mask. If the mask is too large or too small, this is one of the problem we have. We don't have a wide variety of masks in the ICUs and the patients. Some but one problem, and then uh, some you can change certain, uh, like you know, soft silicon uh, one. Sometimes some people. People uh, may like it. And then explanation now, unless the patient is explained what is going to happen, they will be quite, you know, uh, worried. I mean, frightened by the sudden gush of gases. So you have to explain and start from a slower pressures and go up other than applying a very high pressure initially. And then assessing frequently, especially training the nurses to look at the exhalation waveform. Other than trying to listen to the leak, you know, putting the mouth is a dangerous thing because they can have uh, infections. You'll get more illnesses if you try to do that, you know, getting too close to the patient and listening for leaks. But you look at the waveform, you can look at from a distance and say that the patient mask is not fitted properly and you can adjust it until you get a good waveform. Okay, um, I think my time is up unless you uh, have extra time. So... I hope I gave you some kind of uh, insight into practical aspects of managing patients on ventilation. Anybody having any question, I can answer. I have a few more scenarios, but I don't think I have enough time to go through. 